It's drive in. Lord's blessings with sunshine. What an amazing thing. If you want to sing along with us, we're going to start off with an old Hank song. Hopefully, it'll go over very, very well. Here we go. One, two, three.
He was just saying amen. That's it.
called Graves the Garden. If you look around you, it's a lot of graves. <clears throat> a lot of people planted there, but God's going to turn them into something special one of these days.
Father God, we thank you that you do all these things in spite of who we are. We pray and ask, Lord, that as we open up your word, speak to our hearts and challenge our lives. God, that you teach us how to, how to listen to you, how to know that it is you that's speaking, not just the voices that are around us. God, I thank you for each person that's here. God, I know that it's not by chance, but you divinely appointed us to be here. Lord, I pray that your word would come through clear, touch and challenge hearts and lives. And God, that you would bless each and every person that can hear your word, whether it be through the internet, or whether it be through Facebook Live, or whether it be here in this parking lot. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that nothing catches you by surprise. Thank you that we can come to you, we can cast our cares on you, and you take care of them because you care for us and you love us. Father, I just pray for you to have your will and your way today to speak to us and to speak through us, for it's in the name of Jesus I ask this prayer. Amen. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you again today. I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you've had a wonderful week and that you're uh, not sick in any way, shape, or form. It's a beautiful day uh, for the Lord's Day for us to be out here and be able to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And uh, I just have a question for you. How do you know when God's talking to you? Is that an easy thing to summarize? Is that an easy thing to come about? Is it an easy thing to figure out that this is God and it's not just me or this is God and it's, you know, not the voice of Satan or the voice of reason, the voice of something else? There's a lot of voices that are vying for our attention today. There's a lot of voices that are out there that are asking us to, to change and, and that are going to be challenging to our faith in a tremendous way. There's a voice of, of reason that says, look, fear is great. Uh, the voice of skepticism teaches us that, you know, whether the information is given to you uh, as true or not, you should probably still trust it. <clears throat> There's the voice of hysteria, which brings about chaos to the masses. I think all of these voices are being heard loud and clear, and a lot of people are following those voices. And many times we're challenged to hear the voice of God because everything else is so loud around us. I hope to be able to clear that up a little bit today. I hope that today when we finish the message that you'll be able to distinguish when it's God that's speaking to you and nothing else. If you have your Bibles, you can take them. You can turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. That's where we're going to take our scripture from today. But it's one of the most difficult things that we're ever challenged to do is to be able to, to recognize the voice of God, to know that it's God speaking, to know that, that, that He is talking and communicating with us. And as we hear that challenge, that we're willing to, to step up and follow through with what it is that He would have us to do. And so if you have your Bibles there, let me give you just a background of what's going on up until 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be talking about a guy by the name of Elijah. And Elijah had just defeated uh, the Baal prophets on Mount Carmel. He was able to slay 450 of them. King Ahab went and reported things to his lovely wife, King, uh, Queen Jezebel, who was ready to kill Elijah in every way, shape, or form. Elijah tucks tail and he runs and he goes and he hides out in a cave. And we're going to pick up in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 9. And here the Bible says, And there he went into the cave and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets by the sword or with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord and behold, I or the Lord will pass by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And so it was that when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out, and he stood at the entrance of the cave, and suddenly the voice came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. 
Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu, will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 of Israel, all whose knee have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Father, we thank you for the truth of the reading of your word. And God, as we seek to discern your voice today, to hear and be able to recognize that it is you that is speaking to us, challenging us, moving us, calling us, Father, that we would know for certain that it's you today. I pray, God, that you would help us to gain understanding and discernment from all the voices that are out there. Lord, I ask now that you would hide me behind the cross and that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, O oh God. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. We see Elijah here in a cave, hiding out, fearful for his life, wondering what's going on. Hiding because of some woman who said she was going to kill him if she could find him. Not knowing that God had already blessed him in so many ways. Not remembering the great victory that he just had on Mount, Mount Carmel. But here's Elijah tucking tail and running, feared for his life. And I'm afraid that some of us today are afraid for our lives because of all the things that are going on around us. We're afraid of the virus. We're afraid of our jobs not being there. We're afraid of what the government may do or may be going to do or may be trying to do. We're afraid of our friends and our family members and our loved ones who may not make it through these difficult times. And we're listening to so many voices that are out there. And God is trying to speak. God is trying to talk to us. But we can't hear because there's so much clutter. And so I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you today and I want to share with you uh, some things that may help you to be able to discern and recognize that it's God that is speaking to you. The first thing I want you to recognize is that the wind and the storms are distractions in our lives. I don't know about you, but the wind blew last night. You can see some of the evidence of it with all the pollen that's going around. Some of it's getting in my throat and I'm having a difficult time talking today and that's okay. I have a cough and fit while we were singing just a minute ago. I know some of you have seen the destruction of wind, trees down, power lines down. They had several tornado warnings south of here and east of here all night long up until about 1 o'clock in the morning. People were wondering what's going to happen. And the wind is awesome. It's a tremendous power, but we see in this passage of Scripture that the Bible says in verse number 11, then God said to go out and stand in before the mountain of the Lord, and behold, the Lord will pass, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains, broke the rocks into pieces, before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. You see, the, the wind is often static. The wind here refers to the voice of reason. What's the voice of reason? The voice of reason is not biblical. It's the voice of the world. It's the voice that makes sense. It's the voice of rationality. That, you know, this, is, this has to happen. This is what's going on. This is why this is taking place. It's a voice that, that lets us think that, you know what, there has to be an expla explanation for every event that occurs. The voice of reason wipes out faith in every way, shape, or form. The voice of reason is Satan who's speaking to us, saying, you know what, that God that you believe in, he's not big enough to take care of you. That God that you're crying out to, he doesn't even hear you right now. Oh, remember what you just did. Remember the sin that's going on in your life. That's why that God's not listening to you, because you're an utter failure. You see, that's the voice of reason that comes through, and it speaks to our heart. It speaks to our mind and we start believing and we start listening to it when all along we should be listening to the voice of truth and that voice of truth is found in the word of God. When we study God's word, we see what truth really is. We see absolute truth and we get on our hands and knees and yet we need to cry out to God. But listen to me, the most important act of prayer is we need to shut up and listen to God speaking to us. You see, God is trying to speak and the storms are blowing and the winds are going and the voice of reason is out there. The winds are destructive if we seek them out. Storm chasers get paid a lot of money to have cameras on their cars and go to the heart of places where these huge tornadoes go. And the best storm chasers are the ones who usually don't survive. They've got the cameras and they get there and they get in the place and they see these amazing tornadoes. They see the destructive ability of a tornado. But then the tornado takes a crazy turn and starts coming at them and they can't get away. 
And if we listen to the voice of reason, it's going to lead us down a path of destruction in which we will not be able to get away from. Here we see the winds tore the rocks and broke the mountains. I've never seen wind do that. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've never seen wind tear rocks, but I, I believe, according to God's word, that it happened. And there are people, I mean, you can, you can see where winds blow across deserts and blow across mountains. You can see what's cut out. A lot of people think a lot of that was made by water, and some of it is, but some of it's made by the wind. The wind's a powerful entity. And the wind right here, it can do some great and wonderful things. And so many times the wind of our life is pride saying, you know what? God, it's amazing what you're doing. Look at, look at all these wonderful things that I'm doing. Have we ever been guilty of saying, look what I did? Look how I'm, I, I'm being successful. Look at these wonderful things that, that I'm accomplishing. And we leave God completely out because the voice of reason says, no, you did that. God didn't do that through you. God's not using you. That's just how smart you are. That's how innovative you are. That's that amazing talent that you have. You're just an amazing specimen of humanity. And we start believing that, thinking that we are somebody when we really aren't. And the amazing thing is if we listen to that wind and we sow to that wind, the book of Hosea chapter 8 verse 7 says this, if we sow to the wind, we'll reap the whirlwind. We can start believing the voice of reason and we can start believing the lies of Satan and before too long we're so far away from God we couldn't hear him if he was speaking through a megaphone. If we listen to the voice of reason, we rationalize God completely out of our lives saying, you know what God, I got this, I don't need you, I'm a pretty good person on my own, I'm pretty dependent, oh, not to think that God gave you air to breathe, not to think that God gave you a brain that causes all that thing inside your body to work the way it does. Oh no, I'm just an evolved species. This is who I am today. And we can believe the lies, and when we believe the lies, it will lead us and lead us and lead us astray. Peter was told to get out of the boat and walk on the water. And as long as Peter listened to the voice of Jesus and stepped out in faith and looked at Jesus, he was okay. But all of a sudden, you know what happened? The winds blew and the waves rose, and he listened to the wind, and he saw the waves, and he started to sing. And too many times we stop listening to the voice of truth and we listen to the voice of reason. Man, these waves are real. Man, that wind is really strong. Jesus, I'm going under. True. When we need to be taking hold of the hand of Jesus Christ. Jonah said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own thing. God wants me to go to preach at Nineveh. I'm going to go to Joppa. I'm tired of going and following you, God, because I don't like those people in Nineveh. I hate them. I detest them. I don't want to see them repent. I want to see you wipe them out. That was Jonah's mindset. It's what he wanted. How many times in our lives do we have people that we don't like that God's telling us to go witness to and share our faith with and, and, and we won't do it because we want to see God judge them. We want to see God give them ultimate judgment right there, punish them in some way, shape, or form. I was speaking with a young man just before service today and he was telling me that about an instance in his life where his daughter was killed. And he was at a funeral for his daughter. And the man who killed him, his father was there. And God told him. God didn't suggest it. God told him. I want you to go shake that man's hand and forgive him. You see, the voice of reason said, no. I want to go over and kill him. The voice of reason says, no, there's no way that I can shake that man's hand and forgive him after what he has done to me. But if you listen to the voice of God and you go and you shake that man's hand, you find out that God releases a burden from you like you've never had before lifted. And you find out that the person's hand that you're shaking is a dead man walking because they don't know Jesus Christ. You see, if we listen to the wind... It'll cause us to go crazy. The voice of reason will wind us up in a, a distant place from God, a place where we can't hear God. And listen to me, Satan is real and Satan wants to be loud. And the wind's pretty loud. But the amazing thing is, not only is there wind that's destructive and it brings out the voice of reason, but the Bible says right here in verse 
number 11 it says it was a great and strong wind and it tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the lord but the lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake but the lord was not in the earthquake earthquakes happen in our lives don't they earthquakes are deceptions earthquakes you can't see them you can't predict them you don't know that they're coming and all of a sudden things start going crazy in your life you can't look out and say, well, this looks like a really nice, safe place because if the earth decides to move, you're going to start wondering, am I, am I, have I been taking some kind of crazy medicine? Have I, I been drinking some kind of crazy alcohol? What's going on? Why are my feet moving below me? Most of the people in this area of the country don't even know what earthquakes feel like because we're not accustomed to them. But if you go out to California, they know what an earthquake feels like. And it's a deceptive thing. And the deception of earthquakes are the emotional highs and lows in our life. Has anybody ever been on cloud nine? Look, here's Elijah. He was just on cloud nine. He was at the top of Mount Carmel. He was killing the prophets of Baal. He saw God rain down fire from heaven and consume two sacrifices and two altars. And now all of a sudden he comes off of the mountain and he's tucked his tail and he's running and he's hiding in a cave because somebody said, you know what, I want to kill you. He was so valiant when he was slaying the prophets of Baal. He was so valiant when he was sitting there making fun of them that you need to cry out to your God. He's asleep. He don't hear you. He was so strong when he stood up and even said, look, I'm going to pray that it doesn't rain and it didn't rain. And he's able to tuck his tail and he was able to outrun chariots because God gave him some immense speed. He was so strong on the mountain that all of a sudden the emotion was gone. It was drained and he's at the bottom of the valley. Hiding in a cave. You see, some of the most awesome and emotional experiences have nothing to do with God. Have nothing to do with the life change in our life. We, we go through emotional experiences and they're, they're, they're fantastic. They feel good. They're exciting. They're adrenaline. I mean, that adrenaline gets to pump and those endorphins go crazy. And it gives us a feeling that we've never had before. There's all kinds of physical and chemical things that are going on in our body from oxytocin being released and a lot of different things that I don't even know what I'm talking about half the time. But these things make us feel good. These are feel good. Things are released in our body and, and through emotion, great things happen. But if we hold on to our emotions, sometimes we will miss heaven. Remember the rich young ruler. He was there. And he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. He said, I've done those since I was a youth. And Jesus looked at him and said, well, well, great. But the young man looked at Jesus and said, but, but there's something else like, what else must I do? One thing you like, Jesus said, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. The Bible says the young man walked away sorrowfully. You see, he was feeling pretty good about himself. He was on that emotional high that God's telling me, look, you've done fantastic. You've done a wonderful thing. You've kept the commandments. You're going to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, maybe not. Because you still got something else that's coming out before God, which is your riches. Thinking of Simon the Magician in Acts chapter 16, he was there and, and he was asking for these crazy things. And Paul turned around and rebuked him. Peter rebuked him, excuse me, in, in Acts chapter 6 and said, you know what? You can't have the power that, of the Holy Spirit. He wanted to profit from the Holy Spirit. He was on an emotional high. He say, saw great and wonderful things happen. You think of the life of Judas, man. He lived with Jesus. He walked and talked with him for three and a half years. He had everything going for him. But Judas, after he realized that he had turned over Jesus, after he realized who Jesus was, he couldn't live with his life. And he went out and he hung himself. You see, the emotional highs are an amazing thing. Now listen to me. God's not always in emotionalism. I can remember a couple nights ago, I was watching some people sing. And as they were singing songs, they were unlikely heroes, but they brought tears to my eyes. I could remember watching a video on Facebook this week as a soldier came home and his dog recognized who he was and just spent five minutes knocking him down, licking him, and just overwhelmed with him. And he had been gone for 10 months, but that dog never forgot who he was. It brought tears to my eyes. I've heard people tell things and share life stories. Heather and I can sit around and talk about some of the crazy things that happen, and we'll laugh and hee-haw and have a gut buster over stupid things that we've done. Like try to open up a door that doesn't really exist and pull it off. My wife knows exactly what I'm talking about. She's laughing right now. 
We've done some crazy things and we get joy and pleasure out of the emotion of laughter. I can sit and watch basketball games and football games and I can yell and scream at the TV and get mad at the players and get mad at the officials and some of y'all do that too, right? Because that competitive spirit's there. And so emotionalism is a wonderful thing. We need it. It drives us. It gives us great and exciting health. But the amazing thing is, is emotionalism doesn't save anybody. Emotionalism won't take you where you need to go. Now, God does want us to worship Him with emotionalism. He wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth, the Bible says. In John chapter 4, 24, it says, True worshipers, God's going to worship me in spirit and in truth. Spirit is with life and with emotionalism. Hopefully you have some emotion. Hopefully you have some life. Hopefully you're breathing and you're crying out to a holy God and you're worshiping Him with all that you are when we're singing, when we're praying, when we're reading Scripture. You're talking to God. But listen to me. Not everybody who has an emotional experience knows Jesus Christ. I know countless people who've had emotional experiences who have fallen under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and they hear and they cry out and they weep over their sin and they're sorrowful for it, but they never walk away with a changed life. And they're still as lost today as they've ever been. There's a lot of people who've done wrong and they know that they've done wrong. And they've got caught for doing wrong, but then they stand before a judge and a judge exonerates them. And they never have to suffer the consequences for the wrong. And they're so excited and they're so rejoicing and they're so thankful. But guess what? It didn't change their life. They're the same person they always were. You see, if we listen to the earthquakes in our life and the emotionalism that's around us and it doesn't lead us to a changed life, then it leads us to a lost life. And so the earthquakes, the deception that's there, the highs and lows can lead us to do some crazy things. Emotions are real. Listen to me how real emotions are. 76% of the people in the United States of America, 76% of the people in the United States of America own some kind of an emotional drug, some kind of antidepressant, some kind of medicine that will calm them down in some way, shape, or form, something that has distracted their mind and their will. It's the wrong kind of spirit, folks. It's not the Holy Spirit. That's an intoxication that's causing you to live a, a life of peace. But when you come to know Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about those emotions because He promises to give you a peace that passes all understanding. He tells us to be anxious in nothing, but with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known to God and He will give us a peace that passes all understanding and our hearts and our minds will be guarded by Jesus Christ. So we have the winds and we have the earthquakes and the Bible says that there was also fire. In verse number 12 it says, And after the earthquake fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Trial by fire. Anybody know what trial by fire is? It's pretty rough, isn't it? It's pretty rough to be put in the fire and be pulled out and put in the fire and be pulled out and put in the fire and be pulled out. That's what we do to steal to make it stronger. We put it in fire, we pull it out, we cool it off, we put it in, we heat it up, we pull it out, we cool it off, and it, it strengthens it over and over and over, trial by fire. But listen to me, not every trial by fire is of God, but there are trial by fire that are from God. The trials by fire that are from God, listen to me, God will allow fire to come in your life to try you, to draw you into a closer walk with Him. The, the trials that God places in our life that are trials by fire will drive us to Jesus. It'll drive us to Jesus in everything that we do. The fire from God will always lead us to a changed life. If you remember countless times throughout the Gospels, when Jesus came to someone who had sin in their life, He always looked at them, He always healed them, He told them what was wrong, and He always said these amazing words, Go and sin no more. Change life. You see, the fire from God that bring about trials will always point us and lead us to giving God the glory. Not looking at what I did, but thankful that God used me to accomplish whatever He did. Because I'm nothing. I'm just a vessel. Stephen, when he was being stoned, he was crying out, thanking God. He was crying out, forgiving people. He was pointing glory to God in everything that was happening. And yet it cost him his life. You see, there is trial by fire, but there's also fire from our, our life. Trial from fire from God and fire from life. The fire from life says, you know what? I know better. 
It's, it's a fire from life that always results in sin. It could be natural sickness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that, that the wage of the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I don't care who you are, if you can hear me and if you can see me right now. Sickness is going to come your way. Death is evident for all of us. It's going to happen. And we shouldn't get angry and upset at God when it happens. Why? Because we've all sinned. Romans 3.23 tells us that and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of sin, our payment is death. We're going to get sick. We're going to have difficulties. We're going to break bones. There's all kinds of things that are going to happen. And listen, it's not God's fault. It's our fault because we chose to sin. And because we chose to sin, we allowed those things into our life. And now the consequences come out at times that we wish that they didn't. I know a lot of people who were young in life and who wish that, you know what, I wish that I was different. I can tell you myself at 45 years old, I wish that my knees didn't hurt as bad as they do. I wish that they were strong like they were when I was 25, when I could run like crazy, when I could jump like crazy, when I was foolish in life. But you know what? The consequences of sin in my life, I've got pain in my knees now. And so if we're not careful, the fires from life will result, or a result from sin. Fire from life can also be a result of disobedience. Jesus tells us this. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. What are the commands he's talking about? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't do a good job with both of those. I'd love to say that I'm an expert at loving God and loving people. But I can tell you this. People rub me wrong from time to time. And I get disappointed. And when people rub me wrong, I have a hard time loving them. And when I have a hard time loving them, it's because I'm not loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. He also said that other people are going to know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Can the world look at us and see our love for one another and say, you know, that person really knows Jesus Christ. He's sold out. He's born again. I want what they've got because they love people no matter what. I don't understand how they can do that. And I struggle. I want to love people. I want to be what God would have me to be, and I'm sure you do too, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. Sometimes it's, I, I used to have our great uncle, he's gone on to be with the Lord. I loved him to death. He used to take me fishing all the time. His name was Hillary McKee, and we called him Cuz, because he called everybody Cuz. And the amazing thing about him, well, he would never say a negative thing about a person. Never would. He wouldn't, tell, he wouldn't say anything bad about anybody. He'd look at you and say, cuz, I just can't break bread with him. What an amazing thought. To be able to look at somebody and say, you know what, I, I just can't be around them, but I can't say anything bad about them. I wished I was that good. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, for it is better if it's the will of God for us to suffer doing good things rather than doing evil things. Sufferings are going to come. Trial by fire is going to come. It can come from God or it can come from our own choice. We can put ourselves in bad situations where bad outcomes are going to happen. And the consequences of those outcomes, we can pay for today or we can pay for the rest of our life. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You see, we're going to go through some struggles. Fire can also be caused by a result of blindness, satanic blindness. I'm not saying you're a Satan follower in any way, shape, or form. But I will tell you what Scripture tells you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6, it says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age, that being Satan, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservant for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of the darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God to the face of Christ Jesus. You see, there's a lost and dying world out here who has a very difficult time believing in Jesus Christ, believing that it, they think it's crazy for us to come and worship Him today. They think it's crazy for us to sing worship songs, for us to open the Bible, for us to pray. They think it's crazy. Why? Because Satan has got their mind all messed up, thinking, you know what, reason's the deal. Rationality is the deal. All these emotional experiences, all these spiritual aspects, everything that's going on that this world has to throw off, that's the direction you need to go, and that's who you need to follow. And if we're not careful, we'll believe it. 
Listen to me, fires in our life can be destructive. You think about wildfires, think about the wildfires that happened over in Australia, very destructive. Millions and millions of acres burned. You think about volcanic eruptions and the houses that are just mold over and the land and the trees that are just destroyed because of it. Fires can be destructive, but fires from God can be a good cause. You think of the refiner's fire, you think of taking that, that, that precious gold or precious silver and putting it in the fire and taking it out and putting in, burning away all the dross, burning away all the impurities to get the purified, most pure piece of gold or most pure piece of silver that you can get. A refiner's fire is okay. You think of controlled burns and those of you who know what controlled burns, burning out the undergrowth and how beautiful the canopy in the forest becomes, those things can be very helpful. But listen, God wasn't in this fire. The Bible says that after the earthquake, a fire, but God was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. God always speaks to us in a still small voice. He's always that voice that you have to block out all the clutter. One of my favorite movies that's out there, and it's been, been a while, is For Love of the Game. Kevin Costner plays a pitcher. And he gets up on the mound, and I mean, they're in Yankee Stadium, and there's 40,000 people yelling and screaming in there. And he says, clear the mechanism, and all of a sudden, it's just perfect silence, him and the catcher, and he talks to himself. You now we need to clear the mechanism. We need to clear the mechanism of all the crazy voices that Satan is throwing at us, all the noise of the world, so that we can hear the still, small voice of God. Listen to me. Satan comes at you and he's always loud and proud. Satan will lead you into good so that you miss God's best. Satan will throw things up in your life that look good that aren't bad. I, you know, it's not bad for you to have a good job. It's not bad for you to make money. It's not bad for you to be a worker in the church. But if those things come before a relationship with God, then they are bad. God has great for you, but sometimes we settle for good. You think of the story of the Good Samaritan. It was the right thing for the priest to look at the body and walk away because he would be spiritually unclean. He would be socially unclean. He would have to go through a cleansing period. He couldn't go through his priestly duties. It was right for the Levite to look at him and walk away because he too was a religious leader. But the Samaritan looked and said, you know what? I'm no better than this man. This man's hurting. I'm willing to give him of my life so that he can have life. You see, it wasn't wrong for the other two guys to walk away in any way, shape, or form, but they missed the best of God, and the Samaritan got it because he was able to help the man out. He was able to give to him what he needed. Satan will always cause you to follow those things which will lead you astray. Listen to me very carefully in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 3, through 3. The Bible says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times the some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding them to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. There's some people out there that'll lead you astray and tell you some crazy things and tell you not to do this and not to do that. Listen to me. If it's not in God's word, you don't need to follow it. It's a lie. This is truth. Study the Word of God. Don't listen to the voices that are out there that Satan rises up in crazy, deceptive people who are willing to follow him for whatever reason. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, the Bible says this. It says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of evangelists and fulfill your ministry. You see, there are people out there right now who are profiting off the gospel in a big way. There's pastors and preachers and evangelists out there who are worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, and they live in compounds. They won't let anybody come and see them. And they've got a lot of people being led astray because they tell people what they want to hear. I don't ever desire to get up here and tell you what you want to hear. I always want to desire to tell you what God's telling me to tell you. I always desire to speak to you the truth that's in God's word because he holds me to a higher standard to tell you the truth. Why? Because I love you and I love you so much that I don't want to see you go astray. I don't want to see you perish in hell. 
But there's a lot of people who, who preach for job security. They preach, you know what, I want to teach these people what they want to hear so that everything will be good in their lives. I want to preach to them so that they'll continue to give money. I want to preach to them so that our church will be filled. You can fill up the building all you want to. The church is you and I. And it don't matter where we are, whether we're outside in this parking lot. The Bible says we're two or more gathered in my name. I'm in the midst. Listen, folks, Jesus Christ is here. The Holy Spirit is here. God is here in this place today. We don't have to be confined to a building. And sometimes I thank him that we're not. Because there's a group of people right now who can hear my voice who haven't ever heard it before. Why? Because we have amplification and we get to turn it up a little bit. There's people who've never heard me who've come and visited and we greatly appreciate you coming and being a part. If there's anything we can ever do to minister to you, we're here for you. But God always speaks in a still small voice. Satan is always loud and proud. Satan always comes in and makes things bigger than life. God always speaks directly to you. He's always going to call you by name. Here with Elijah, he looked at him. He said, Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? What are you doing here, Elijah? He didn't say, what are you doing here, John? He didn't say, what are you doing here, Joe? He didn't say, what are you doing here, Steve? No, he said, Elijah. Why? Because he was talking to Elijah. When Jesus was walking along the road, and this little short guy climbed up in a tree, and he got up under the tree, and he looked up at him, and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. He didn't look at him and say, Jose, come down. Why? Because his name was Zacchaeus, and he called him by his name. When God is speaking to you, he's going to call you by name. Saul, before he became the apostle Paul, was on the road to Damascus with letters to go and persecute the church. Jesus showed up, blinded him, knocked him off his horse, and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't call him anything else. He called him by name. And when God speaks to you, he will call you by name. God always speaks as a gentleman. Listen to me. Jesus never begged anybody. You can study the scripture. You can look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all you want to. Jesus never begged anybody. He would go and he'd say, look, here's what I'm asking you to do. The choice is yours. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he said, if anybody... If anybody desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He didn't say, hey man, I want you to go and I want you to say no to yourself. I need you to go take up your cross and you got to do it right now. You got to follow me. Jesus didn't do that. He just gave an invitation. If anybody, if anybody, guess what? You're an anybody. And if you desire to follow him, Deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. In Revelation chapter 3.20, Jesus was talking to the layout of sea in church and he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he said, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You see, that's a gentleman just knocking on the door. Just knocking. Satan's going to be ringing the doorbell, going to be screaming, going to be knocking the door down. He's going to open the door and come in and say, hey man, did you not hear me knocking? Jesus just stands out there and knocks. Gives us the opportunity to come. I just got out of the shower and I was walking through the house and all of a sudden I heard a knock at the door this morning. I was like, wow, I'm in my underwear. I wonder who that could be. I hope it's my neighbor because my neighbor's my parents. I kind of hid behind the door and opened up. My mom was giving me something. She didn't bang on the door. We don't have a doorbell, but she just kind of knocked. I said, well, what a, what a great illustration to use today. Well, she could have banged on the door. I could remember growing up one time, though. My brother and I were camping out in the backyard. Anybody ever camp out in the backyard when he was growing up? Camped out in the backyard. We probably didn't stay much time in the tent that night. We were all over the place. You know how that goes. Well, it was about 6 o'clock. The sun come up. It was in the summertime. We were ready to eat. It was breakfast time. We'd been up all night. We were hungry. And we came and we knocked on the door and didn't hear nothing. Knocked on the door. And banged on the door. And my mom came and opened the door up. she just gotten out of bed. We don't want any. And slammed the door in her face. <laughs> then we started banging on the door a little bit harder. We wanted to get in and eat. But see, Jesus is not like that. He's just there knocking, wanting us to open the door to let him come in. He's always a gentleman. 
He always speaks with a still small voice. God always speaks to salvation and life change. In John chapter 6, verse 44, the, the Bible says, Jesus is speaking, he says, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last days. You see, God will draw you. He will draw you. He will entice you. He will convict you. He will bring a way to draw you to Jesus so that you can be changed forever. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, Jesus said to him, I want you to be perfect. Go and sell all that you have. He's talking to rich young ruler and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be what you need, get everything out of your life that keeps me from being first place. Think about that for just a minute. What has Satan thrown up in our life that looks good, sounds good, feels good? It's loud and proud and makes us, ooh, I'm good, I'm successful, I am somebody, but it's bigger than God is in our life. We need to get rid of it. We need to get rid of it. In John chapter 8, verse 11, Jesus was talking to the woman who was brought before him in adultery, and everybody was willing to stone her, and they all had rocks in their hands, and he wrote in the sand, they dropped her rocks. And he looked up and he said this, Woman, where are you accusers? She said, Sir, there are none. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She said, Look, I'm not, I'm not here to point out your sin. I've forgiven it. Now go live a different life. Go and live a different life. Have you been listening to the voices of reason? Have you been listening to the false doctrines of the world? Have you been listening to Satan work through you with emotionalism and, and brilliance of fire? Listen to me. God is speaking today. And it's through a still, small voice. He's probably saying something like this. Follow me. He's speaking to you saying, live for me. He's speaking to you saying, repent. He's saying, will you tell others about me? I need you to serve here. Will you surrender? I need you to go and do this or that. There's this area in your life that I need you to give to me. You see, God doesn't force us to follow him. He gives us a choice. I'm reminded of two young brothers. One was about 10 years old and the other one was about five years old. And the five-year-old brother just thought the, the son rose and sat in his daddy. And he loved his daddy and he, he just, I mean, he basically idolized his daddy in every way, shape, or form. And the older brother got tired of it because he had seen his dad let him down. He'd seen his dad fail him. And the younger brother said, you know what, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove to you that daddy's everything that he said he is. And the older brother said, no, I'm gonna prove to you what a failure dad's been. And so they go out and the older brother catches himself a bird. And he comes before his dad and he's got his hands behind his back and he looks at his dad and he says, Dad, he said, my brother right here is just telling me about how awesome, how wonderful and how you do no wrong. And I'm here to prove him wrong because you've let me down so many times. Dad, if you're everything that my younger brother's telling me that you are, I've got a bird in my hand behind my back. I want you to tell me, Dad, is it alive or is it dead? You see, the, the boy had already made up his mind. If his dad said it was alive, he was going to just squeeze real hard and kill that bird and turn around and show him a dead bird. And if his dad said it was dead, he was going to turn around and let it fly away. And his dad looked at him and said, Son, I'm not everything that your younger brother says that I am. I have failed you. I have let you down. I'm not perfect in any way, shape, or form. Son, I love you. I love you, and I'm, I'll, I try my best to always be there for you. But he looked at him, and he said, Son, the choice is in your hands. The choice is in your hands. You see, God is saying to us right now, the choice for you to follow me, the choice for you to live for me, the choice for you to repent and live right, the choice for you to serve me in this capacity, the choice for you to give up this area in your life or to take on some other area of service, that choice is in your hand. God's speaking. He's speaking as gently as he knows how. 
listen to me, the world is really loud. God's speaking with that still small voice. Do you hear it? Do you hear him speaking? Are you willing to obey? See, the choice is yours. He's giving you the choice. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that we will learn to listen to your voice. Lord, the still small voice that's here to speak to us and challenge us and work in our lives. God, that voice that tells us what it is that you would have us to do, whether it's to repent, whether it's to trust you, whether it's to come to know you for the first time, whether it's to live for you, Lord, whether it's to give up things in our life, whether it's to surrender areas of our life, whether this is where we need to serve, whether this is the person that I need to, to look at and, and love for the rest of my life. God, you're speaking to us. You're answering things. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to hear you and to be able to block out all the distracting voices that are out there. Help us to understand how you come to us. How that you're a gentleman. And how that you love us. So Father, I pray right now, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you, that they would cry out to you. They'd trust you. They'd say, Lord, you know what? I'm a sinner. And I hear you telling me I need to be saved. I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me to come into my life, save me and change me. I don't understand it all, but I need it. And Lord, if that's what your plea is and people are hearing that voice, I pray they'd answer. Lord, there may be other, they're saying, Lord, you're telling them to repent. Maybe they just need to come and just fall on their face and say, God, forgive me. I repent. Lord, maybe there's some that need to get on the phone and call somebody because you're telling them they need to apologize. Maybe there's so many things, Lord, that you're speaking to us, that you're giving us, that you're hearing us in the stillness and the quietness of this moment. You were speaking so loud. And we need to act. Will you help us to do just that? Father, thank you for loving us, caring for us. Thank you for second, third, fourth, fifth, hundred thousand time chances over and over and over again. Thank you that you don't give up on us. Lord, I pray that you change hearts and lives today, that you move in a powerful way. Jesus, for in your name we pray. Amen. You may be here and God's spoken to you and you need to do business with God. I ask you to do so. I ask you to uh, be obedient. You can do that right where you are. Praise band's going to be playing a song, I think. And uh, you can... You can do business with God right where you are. Maybe you're at home and you're like, man, I really need Jesus in my life. You can cry out to him. The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can send me a comment. You can message me. If you need something, I'm here. Maybe you need to come and make a parking place, uh, an altar, and just cry out to God just because it does you some good to, to get alone. And to, to do business with God, maybe maybe He's telling you to go to somebody right now and say, man, I, I forgive you. Maybe He's speaking to you, telling you, you know what, this is where I need you to serve. This is where I want you to, to call home because I've got a work for you to do right here. Do you hear His voice? Have you been able to block out all the, the noise and just to hear Him today? See, as soon as you leave this place, Satan's going to get loud. He's going to get loud. He's going to try to distract you in so many ways. And I pray that you just pass that aside and say, no, I ain't got time for that, devil. I'm listening to God. I'm listening to God. get to say hello. I'm going to try to catch you today as we leave today so I can say hello. Facebook, thank y'all for coming and being a part of today. Thank you for joining us live. We will do this next week and for however many weeks to come, but it is.